Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome back to G Senjo no Mao. Let's continue. The wind coursed by him as he stepped outside. A horde of tall buildings stood all around him, blocking the moonlight. Not yet entirely awake, Mao walked up the steps like a sleepwalker wandering purposelessly through the night. Usan. Hor. Why is he uttering her name? A name slowly emerged from his lips. A girl appeared from the sea of his memory. A gallant, heroic figure. <laughs> Mao felt his head clear as confidence filled his heart. <laughs> the daughter of Usami. <laughs> the snapshots in his memory snapped into place. <laughs> and not only Usami. Asai Gonzo and his wild beasts should all be angrily scurrying for Mao right now. Depending on the situation, the plan may have to be changed. There was still time to revise it before Mao's magnum opus was set into action. Even the slightest obstacle could be a premature end to the long-awaited fruit of his ambition. <laughs> Mao laughed. It might be fun to have a strong hero as a rival. A number of intricate plans began to come together in Mao's head. Usami Harue, the little hero has finally grown up. Let this girl pay for her parents' sins. Her parents' sins? What is he talking about? Let's play a little game. Usami Haru, how far can you go? Mao disappeared into the darkness of downtown Tomanbetsu city with light footsteps. His head didn't ache anymore. The cool night drew its curtains. On this particular Sunday, like on any other, Central Boulevard hosted a sea of people. And as usual, Usami Haru walked to her part-time job with her head hung low. She moved forward slowly, ignoring the people around her. A bearded man in an apron welcomed Haru. Haru bowed slightly, the manager shook his head in response as he opened a crate of perfumes. Yeah, she doesn't need makeup. The manager let a disappointed sigh escape from his lips. Haru yawned as she stretched her back and neck. After preparing herself for a day's work, she entered the store. Sate. The manager reached into the pocket of his apron. It was a folded piece of paper. A letter, perhaps? The manager was a good man, despite, as Haru suspected, frequently lying about his age. Haru glanced absentmindedly at the manager's beard as she unfolded the note. And after scanning its contents, she couldn't help but raise an eyebrow. The penmanship itself gave Haru an eerie, unsettled feeling. The writer had used a straight edge to trace his strokes, presumably to camouflage his true handwriting. Some letters had even been cut from magazines and newspapers. After taking a deep breath, Haru asked, The manager raised his eyebrows. The girl before him was not the Usami Haru he employed. Her piercing eyes fired straight through his entirety. Haru tensed up. Time seemed to have stopped. 
Her mind analyzed the facts with incomprehensible speed. And finally, as if to signify her understanding, she raised her head. She bowed deeply. The manager thoughtfully scratched his beard. Haru flashed a big happy grin. Haru dashed out into the busy streets. She parted to the crowds like a boulder splitting through a fierce current. Without letting the deluge of people slow her pace, she marched forward through central blah, 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 blah. As she moved, Haru thought about the strange letter. Oh come, lovely child, oh come thou with me, for many a game I will play there with thee. From this, the first line, Haru could tell this letter indicated a challenge. The rest of the letter served to ignite her heart into a mighty conflagration. For at its end was her mother's name. I am here in Tomanbetsu city. Let us play a game of tag. I will be attending the hunt immediately. To Kaoru. Kaoru is the name of Haru's beloved mother. She was a, viol a violinist. She took Haru with her as she traveled all around the world, captivating the world over with her marvelous performances. Her mother, her mother was always so gentle, yet so strong. No. Calm down, she told herself. If you let your emotions get the better of you, then you've already lost. She couldn't believe that Mao would actually contact her. Oh come, lovely child, oh come thou with me, for many a game I will play there with thee. In that particular Schubert piece, no matter how much the child cried out about the devil, his father refused to believe that the devil even existed. No one could find this fabled Erlkönig, this devil, this Mao. <laughs> It's time. It's now noon. Wearing a black suit, Mao blended in naturally among the crowd of businessmen in the business district. As he walked among the people there, Mao's heart swelled with malicious anticipation. It's been a while since he sent out that letter of challenge, passed on from one person to the next. The letter should have arrived in Usami's hands by now. What would she do when she saw that letter? I wonder if she'll search around the city aimlessly. Mao looked at the cell phone in his hand. If Usami isn't a total idiot, she will soon call this number. That music! Haru already knew where to go. She didn't waste a single minute. Even though the letter from Mao looked meaningless at first glance, he made sure to place a hint within those words. The coffee shop, Lapis Lazuli, the same place that Kiyosuke took her yesterday. She pushed open the door and walked in. She immediately surveyed the premises. If Haru's reasoning was correct, Mao should have come by here. However, she could not find anyone like him among the customers. Just then, a man who appeared to be an employee called out to her. Haru thought for a second before answering confidently. The host seemed relieved upon her words. As he said this, he disappeared behind the counter. After a while, he returned with a small bag. Haru asked as she took the bag from him. Haru immediately realized that the young girl was one of Mao's children. 
Odds were he was using several intermediaries to get in contact with her. It would be difficult to trace any of these agents back to Mao. So, Haru left the coffee shop after offering her thanks. As she walked out, Haru opened the bag. She found only a thin cell phone inside. This is. She examined the cell phone from top to bottom. It was an old model of disposable cell phone. Here on Central Boulevard you can find a lot of unemployed foreigners selling these phones. Even if the police were to investigate this matter, they wouldn't be able to find the phone's original purchaser. It would appear that Mao knows how to cover his tracks. Haru turned on the phone. There was only one number listed. The number was listed as Mao. Her heart raced. She dialed the number with her sweaty hands. At that moment, the din of the city no longer reached her ears. After precisely 10 rings, a weak vibration came from the left side of his chest. Mao grinned. Someone's calling. Trying to suppress his excitement, he took out the phone. He waited for his caller to speak first as he imagined Usami's beautiful voice. He was taken aback by the prop voice. Mao quietly opened his mouth. There was a brief pause as if she were gathering her nerves. Usami spoke in a low voice. Indeed, that was a bit too simple. The next line caused Usami's voice to betray her. She could not conceal her anguish as she receded the final words. Why does he know her mother? He intentionally chose biting words as if playing the part of a typical twisted villain. But this did not deter Usami Haru in the slightest. <laughs> this really was a simple puzzle. I'd be quite disappointed if she couldn't even solve this. The purpose behind this puzzle lies elsewhere. Again, he tried to play with her emotions. Usami ignored Mao's words while continuing to describe her solution to this simple puzzle. The Rudy? Oh, okay. During this entire exchange, Wasami Haru did not show a hint of anger. Mao had hoped that the, his refusal to let the dead rest would unleash the darkness within this girl's heart, that it would reopen long closed wounds. So I guess Mao is responsible for the death of Usami's mother, huh? Nevertheless, Usami said bravely, Mao feels satisfied. This girl is daring indeed. Even if she listened intently to the phone, Haru continued searching for the location of Mao. Ignoring the demon's scathing words, she instead focused on the background noise. After a while, she discovered some clues. Haru said, Haru said, 
今そこで誰かが街頭演説をしているだろう。Haru again concentrated on the background noise. Part of the speech included the name of Tomanbetsu City's mayor. His tone implied it would be more strange if she hadn't. Haru finally understood the true reason behind Mao's challenge. He wants to test her. She was in a terrible situation. She didn't expect her opponent to find her workplace. Even though Haru still doesn't know his identity, Mao already knows hers. Mao scoffed at that. He certainly sounded happy, but his words seemed a little artificial. As a result, she still couldn't figure him out. But unfortunately for her, he was always guiding their conversations. Even when Mao talks about himself, he never gives anything important away. It seems Mao has no intention of showing his face. This is a challenge. And with that, he hung up the phone. Haru sprang into action. She caught sight of the Sanno Corporation headquarters. The park was nearby, somehow escaping the shadow of the gargantuan skyscraper. It was quite a beautiful scene. The park was surrounded by an assortment of bustling businesses, making its presence even more pronounced. The bulletin board was at the center of the park. Under normal circumstances, it would display the general guidelines and park rules. Today, though, it's covered in red graffiti. At first glance, it appears to be the work of local delinquents. Close examination, however, reveals that the markings are actually a rather detailed passage. It was clear that this graffiti was the work of Mao. From here, the hero must choose one of three paths. One path leads to Mao, one path leads to hell, one path leads to heaven. There will be more information on each path. Take care to examine it thoroughly. Truth is written on the path to Mao. Lies are written on the path of hell. Truths, lies, and half truths are written on the path to heaven. Now, can you find where I am? How do we immediately begin to search around the park? As was indicated, there should be a message located near the path. She soon found that message near the park's northern entrance. There was a steep staircase leading to the business district. The handrail of the stone staircase bore a short note. On the same glaring red paint and long slender lettering as the message in the park. The exit of subway station 10 leads to heaven. She could just barely make it out. Haru immediately absorbed information. Station 10 just so happens to be Central Boulevard's main station. Haru could see several red haired youngsters loitering near the exit. Haru carefully examined her surroundings until she finally saw another message on the handrail. Warehouse number 3 along the docks of the western district leads to hell. It was too far to reach by foot. However, if she doesn't go to that warehouse, she won't be able to solve the puzzle. Tech indeed. Do you plan to have me run around the entire city, Mao? Haru walked down the stairs. There were just as many people in this underground passageway as there were on the surface. She bought a ticket and now awaits the subway to the western district. For someone as poor as Haru, the 250 yen ticket really is a painful expense. After about an hour, she finally reached the harbor. The winter sea quietly splashed against the docks. This part of the city is deserted on Sundays. 
Thus, she found the warehouses without fighting the crowds she had earlier. The third warehouse's number was clearly marked on its closed shutters. Haru searched for a message from Mao. She found a suspicious slip of paper on the shutter. But this is not the path to heaven. After reading this final clue, Haru pinched her forehead. Now she finally has all the pieces. Which of the three paths should she take? One, the staircase near the park. Two, the exit of subway station 10. Three, warehouse number three along the docks of the western district. And the path to Mao. The path to heaven. The path to hell. Which message corresponds to which path? Obviously, she needs to pick the path to Mao. In addition, truth is written on the path to Mao. Lies are written on the path to hell. Truths, lies and half-truths are written on the path to heaven. Now Hado thinks about where she found each note. One, on the handrail of the stairway near the park was the note. The exit of subway station 10 leads to heaven. Two, beside the exit of subway station 10 was the note. Warehouse number three along the docks of the western district leads to hell. Three, at the third warehouse in the western district was the note. This is not the path to heaven. After sorting everything, she began to analyze the information. Suppose number one is the path to Mao. In that case, the message found there about subway station 10, that it is the path to heaven would have to be true. To find the answer, you only need to do some calculations. Just as she was in the middle of thinking, Haru's cell phone rang. Mao must have calculated the time she needed to reach here and timed his call accordingly. Mao glanced at his watch. Mao thought to himself, This is just a test. Any capable person should be able to find the correct answer. If you can find the answer in five minutes, then I'll give you a passing grade. Just as he was about to hang up, Mao listened to Usami attentively. Indeed, anyone with a good sense of logic could quickly figure out the answer. If you discard all the unnecessary information, it really is just a simple equation. As Usami implied, one can just lay out the six possible scenarios and cross out all the ones that cannot be true. That said, Usami figured it all out in an instant. Plus, she didn't need to use pen and paper. She solved it all mentally. Mao did not respond. She really has a rare talent. A faint smile appeared at the corner of his lips. Mao finally acknowledged Usami Haru as an opponent. From the research he had one of his people do on her, she did not seem to have any power, wealth or connections, but she possessed a keen mind seemingly unbelievable for a teenage girl. Mao had thought that his only opposition would come from large powerful organizations like the police and influential corporations. In addition, this talented girl has been looking atlessly for Mao. Initiating contact with her this morning may have been a bit of a rash decision. His defeat may now lay in a place he had never expected. Usami would quickly break through the other games Mao had prepared. Well, it's not a big deal. Yet. She's still just a student. And it's probably safe to say that she has almost no information on me yet. However, Mao knew firsthand how far the combination of a talented mind supported by unwavering conviction can bring someone. This hero may indeed find a weakness in Mao's carefully constructed plan. 
On one hand, Mao felt a rush of excitement from witnessing such a powerful opponent. On the other, in order to not to lose to his opponent, Mao felt a surge of his fighting spirit. The sun had set only moments ago. In its place came the strong winter wind carrying a chill and dark clouds in its wake. Specks of light snow fell on the shoulders of Haru's school uniform before quickly dissipating. Pedestrians flooded the business district. At the bottom of the government office stairway, Haru awaits Mao's appearance. He will. He will come. After that exchange, Mao played another three hours of tag with her. Again and again he tested her mental prowess. In order to make herself worthy of being Mao's opponent, Haru ought to have shown enough of her strength to gain the right to challenge Mao. O come, lovely child, O come thou with me, for many a game I will play there with thee. Mao may think this is just a game, but this is a battle Haru will put all her strength into. Mao's final question was this. If Mao appears at the bottom of the stairs of the government office, then Hiro is not at the top of the stairs. Thus, if Hiro is at the top of the stairs, will Mao not appear at the bottom of the stairs? The conclusion, if Hiro is at the top of the stairs, Mao will not appear at the bottom. If she wants Mao to appear, Haru must not be at the top of the stairs. In order to meet with Mao, Haru needs to stay at the bottom of the stairs. Only he is taking too long. She could not see anyone like Mao among the passing people. Did I make a mistake? Just as she started to panic, she heard someone call her name. <laughs> Haru looked up the stairs. Haru realized that she had indeed made a mistake. She figured as long as she waited downstairs, Mao would appear there. During their prolonged game of tag, Haru had grown so focused on solving the numerous riddles he presented. So focused that she had forgotten that Mao may have set a trap within the riddles themselves. Mao now drew her attention freely without worry from a place where she could not see him clearly. A man in a large black coat spoke those seductive words. However, his back was facing Haru, and one could not discern his features through the dim street lights. Is this man Mao? Or just one of his underlings? Haru asked the mysterious person. He should be a man. She couldn't really discern the voice at all, though. She thought she may even vaguely recognize the voice, and she couldn't even discount the possibility of the voice belonging to a woman. The girl straightened her posture. She realized her whole body was trembling. Haru clenched her fists to suppress her apprehension. The fear she held slowly drew near. Well, this is no longer a game. The battle has begun.
And now we are back at the title screen. And there is a new option. Next chapter. And we will start the next chapter next time on Jisenjo no Mao. Thanks for watching and have a nice day. Bye bye.